All right, we're going to be looking at uh, Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. And you'll notice here that this is Paul's journey to Corinth. And what you see in this chapter is you see some of the key figures in the early church at Corinth. And I think, uh, like I was praying before, um, I think we can learn a lot from these different figures and there's lessons that we can take from them. Uh, so this is what we're going to be going through today in Acts chapter 18. So the first part of Acts chapter 18, we see the, the figures Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla. So this was a husband and wife duo. So Aquila is a male's name and Priscilla is obviously a female's name. So they were a husband and wife that came initially from Italy. So Acts 18.1, after these things, Paul departed from Athens. So you remember he was on Mars Hill when we looked at it last week and he was preaching the gospel to the Gentiles there and they had the altar to the unknown God. So now he's left there, he's come to Corinth. So if you read through in your own time the epistles to the Corinthian church, you can see the sort of issues that were going on at Corinth. And in this chapter, you can see here that Paul actually stayed in Corinth for quite a while, you know, a year and six months, I think it says later on and and so he knew this church quite intimately you know and there's a lot of issues that he had to deal with at the church and you know there was a point where they were accusing him of being a false apostle and he was you know trying to convince them that he wasn't and there was these other people trying to take advantage of them and you know, there was a fornication in the church and they weren't doing the lord's supper correctly and all these sorts of things and you know there's a lot of things to learn through first corinthians and second corinthians but here in acts chapter 18 there's when you see this is when Paul is heads over to Corinth and he's planting a church there. Found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So like I said, the Aquila and Priscilla were a husband and wife, you know, very active in the early church, very faithful, and we can learn a bit about them. Um, now, if you see here in, in Acts chapter 18, what was the reason why they left Italy, why they left Rome? Well, they were kicked, the Jews under Claudius were kicked out of Rome. Now, what we see in the Bible is later on them returning to Rome. So you see that they had a heart for their brethren back in Rome, that eventually they went back to Rome and, and started a church there. And they had a church in their house because when you read the Roman epistle, look at what it says here. It says here, this is Paul now writing to the Romans. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. So you see how they're back at this time, they're back in Rome, right? And Paul is saying to say hello to them who is at the church in Rome and there's a church in their house who have for my life laid down their own necks. And we saw that in Acts 18. Acts 18, Aquila and Priscilla were tra travelers with Paul. And, you know, obviously... Uh, you know, partook of the same persecution and tribulations that Paul would have suffered as well. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So we can see that Priscilla and Aquila were very faithful, very impactful, where they, you know, not only were, you know, loved of the Corinthian church, but maybe other Gentile churches too, as we see here. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. So Aquila and Priscilla is the first people that we're looking at. And first of all, we can see that they were just faithful. You know, they were faithful not only in the good times, they were faithful to Paul in the bad times. They went on missionary journeys. You know, they were a husband and wife. When they returned, they had a heart for their brethren, for their people back in Rome. They go back to Rome. They don't go back to where they're from and then just stop serving the Lord. They go back there and they're starting a church. They're, you know, they, they have a church meeting in their house. So not only are they they're, they're hospitable as well, where they're willing to, to give their house to host a church at Rome. 1 Corinthians 16, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. So that's now, you know, they're traveling with Paul and, you know, they're writing a letter back to, Paul's writing a letter back to the Corinthian church. We see Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So they continue to stay faithful to the Lord. So what can we learn from 
Priscilla and Aquila. You know, they opened their home to host a church. They were respected of the church in Corinth. And they were a married couple who were faithfully serving the Lord. They even traveled with Paul in to Syria. And they had a heart, like I said, they had a heart to reach their loved ones back in Rome. So one thing I want to say here is, you know, many Christians who get married, unfortunately, reduce in their service to the Lord. You know, and, and when they're young and they're single, they say, you know, I want to find somebody, you know, we're going to serve the Lord together. But then when they get married, what happens? They get married, priorities start to shift. They get busy. You know, they're busy, you know, in their family, their work and things like that. Once, once, they're, once they're married, they're starting a family. Maybe it's due to having a combative spouse. You know, where, you know, one of the spouses, you know, is combative and, you know, doesn't want one spending so much time serving God and whatnot and, you know, making it about, oh, is it, is it me or is it, you know, doing stuff for church? Whatever, but, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, people get married and their service to the Lord decreases. But we want to be like Aquila and Priscilla. We want a marriage where the husband and wife, you know, work together and do great things for God. So we can see it. I mean, this husband and wife working together, doing great things for God in Corinth, doing great things for God in Rome, even sometimes traveling with Paul, you know? So that's the sort of marriage that we want to have. Now, obviously, there are advantages to not being married, like Paul outlines in 1 Corinthians 7. If you're not married, then it's a lot easier to serve the Lord, but it's not for everyone. 1 Corinthians 7.32 but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married care, careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may, she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So you can see how there's a danger here that when people get married, their priorities shift, right? And instead of their life being about serving God, their life starts to be about pleasing their husband, pleasing their wife. And that may be just bad priorities, but it may also just be a combative spouse. You know, you're pleasing them just to keep them happy. So then, you know, you may not be as involved as you once were or you should be. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, so that's like meaning past puberty, and needs so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. So you see, he's not discouraging marriage. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. Now some people misunderstand this passage. They think that Paul is teaching that we shouldn't be married. It's better to be abstinent. And I'm, sure the, I'm sure the Catholics will you know, have, a, have a ball with this verse you know, because they don't think uh, you know, bishops and priests and things should be married and be abstinent. No, what he's saying here is, yeah, of course, there is advantages to not being married. You know, if you're not married and you don't have to please your husband, please your wife, obviously with, you can have less distractions to serve the Lord. But that's not for everyone, you know, because we have that sexual desire. You know, so that desire is there. And, you know, it's not for everyone to, to, to uh, I guess, uh, have that under control, right? So marriage, obviously, is a natural outlet for sexual gratification. And, you know, obviously God wants us to be fruitful and to multiply. So what he's saying here is not going against what God is saying. He's just saying that there is an advantage to not being married for people that can, can uh, sort of control that desire, that they can do more things for the Lord. You know, that's, that's all he's saying here, but he's not saying that it's a bad thing to, do, to be married. He's just saying that, you know, it just, your priorities can shift and, and the time that you can spend serving the Lord uh, will be lessened. So... That's what we're talking about here with Aquila and Priscilla. We don't want our marriage to take away from serving God. So, you know, make sure, one, you marry somebody 
you know, if you're single, that you marry somebody that you can serve the Lord together with. And if you are married, you know, be a spouse that encourages service to the Lord. You know, don't be a spouse that makes it you versus the Lord, right? It should be you both together serving the Lord. Be like Aquila and Priscilla. And, you know, that can come in many different forms. You know, it can come in, you know, nagging or it can come in, you know, different priorities. You know, instead of prioritizing church, you know, you're always organizing things and, and that thing and this thing, and then you're always taking your spouse away from serving the Lord. You're not being a good example. So be the type of marriage like we see here in Aquila and Priscilla. All right, let's go on. Acts 18, 3. And because he was of the same craft, so this is uh, talking about Paul having the same craft or occupation as Aquila, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation, they were tent makers. Right? So Paul is known to be, have the skill to make tents. And this is why he stayed with Aquila and Priscilla, because they also, in Corinth, were making tents as well. So it provided him a way uh, to make some income on the side. Now, tent making, the word tent making, is often the term used for when a preacher uh, you know, also does some secular work for income. So when you have a minister like myself, also doing secular work, you know, working a job, you know, people will often say, oh, you know, you're a tent maker. This is where it comes from, right? Because Paul, even though he was a preacher and he was supported by the churches, did work on the side to earn a bit of extra income. Now, there are those who think, you know, ministers like myself, you know, should never be paid. And unfortunately, in those circumstances, I think the word of God can become neglected, right? Because if every preacher... You know, it was just always had to work full time as well. You're not going to have people committed full time to the ministry. And you know, there are but there are also those who think that ministers should not have any secular work at all, and they actually neglect to provide for their families because you know, if the church does not have enough to provide for the the living of the minister, obviously he has to work. Like Paul, like if he's not being supported enough, he has to work in order to provide for himself and, and things like that. So, you know, we still, as ministers, have a responsibility to provide for our family. But I have met ministers before that don't believe ministers should ever work and the church is not providing enough for them and they're actually then just neglecting to provide for their own family, which is not good either. So there's not a right or wrong. It's not that there's one or the other. It really depends on the circumstances, right? Now, what is the ideal situation, though? I mean, the ideal situation is that ministers need not have secular work, right? But circumstances, unfortunately, are not always perfect. So here we see Paul, you know, he's planting new churches, and he may have needed to work out of necessity, right? Because, you know, initially there was no church in Corinth to support him. Because, I mean, he's going there and planting churches. I mean, the church doesn't exist yet but to support his work there. And then when you read in Corinthians, which we're going to go through now, there were some issues in the Corinthian church as well. So here, there's a need for him to work and to, I guess, you know, tent making, make tents. So look at here in 2 Corinthians 11, because one reason why Paul did not take um, wages of the church in Corinth is because there was a dispute over you know, him being accused of being a false apostle and others trying to take advantage of the Corinthian church. So he refrained from taking wages of the Corinthian church to show them that he wasn't doing it for money. And he actually addresses this in the second Corinthian epistle. He says here in verse 7, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? So what is he referring to? He's referring to the fact that he did not take wages from the Corinthian church to support him. Because I've preached the gospel, because I've preached to you the gospel of God freely. See, so that's what he's referring to. Why is he saying he's abasing himself? Because ministers are meant to be supported by the church. You know, that's the way it's meant to work. But he's refrained from that. He's making tents in Corinth because of the issues that are going on in the Corinthian church. Now, the reason why I'm addressing this is because a lot of people will use the fact that Paul worked to say that ministers should not be paid by the church. But what I'm trying to show you here is even though he made tents in Corinth, he made it clear in his epistle to the Corinthians, in the second Corinthian epistle, that 
ministers do have a right to take wages from the church. Because look at what he says here in verse 8. He says, so he's saying in verse 7 that he did not take wages from the Corinthian church. But in verse 8, he says, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. So you see there that churches have an obligation to provide for the ministers of their church, just like the Corinthian church had an obligation. But because he took wages of the Philippian church, from the churches in Macedonia, they were supporting him while he was making tents. So he's making tents in Corinth. He's getting support from the Macedonian churches, like from Philippi. And then he says to the Corinthian church, look at how he phrases it. He says, I robbed other churches. Why does he say that? Why does he say he robbed other churches? Because it was the Corinthian church's responsibility to pay for Paul's way in Corinth. And he's taking from other churches, even though he's not ministering to them, he's ministering to the Corinthian church, and he says, hey, I robbed other churches. Right? Why? Because he's, they're paying for him when he's not even ministering to them at this time. Taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. So Macedonia, remember, is where Philippi was, and he actually refers to this in the Philippian epistle. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. So why was he doing this? Well, he goes on. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Archive. Now, he, he's not boasting because he's saying, look, oh, I, don't need a, I don't need a paycheck from you guys. I pay my own way. That's how some people have uh, you know, referred to this sort of boasting. Now, the boasting is that and, and it's not like this sort of prideful boasting. He's making the point that he's he was trying to minister to the Corinthians and he loved them and, he, and he, was, he wasn't doing it for money. That's what he's talking about here. So, you know, people may have been accusing him. Oh, you know, he's just doing this for money, just like the false apostles and false prophets were doing. So he was trying to make this point to the Corinthians, say, you know what, look, I'm going to do it without charge because I want to show you this is not about the money, Right? Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. For what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. See, because he's trying to expose those that are doing it for the money. And he's saying, look, they're going to they're gonna be exposed to be what you are accusing us of. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So that's one reason, right? One reason is out of necessity. Maybe it's the situation like we see in 1 Corinthians. Um, another reason we see in 2 Thessalonians 3. Another reason is just for the minister to be an example to the church of how to work hard and provide for oneself. Now you can imagine that this can happen in maybe churches in lower socioeconomic areas, maybe third world countries where people are being lazy, people are living off the government, and the preacher may come just to go, hey look, this is how you should work, this is how you provide for yourself, and just providing an example uh, to the church that they're ministering to there. 2 Thessalonians 3, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye have received of us. Now what is this disorderly walking that he's referring to in 2 Thessalonians? It's the fact that they're being lazy and not working to provide for themselves. And he goes into this in the next couple of verses. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labour and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. So you can see here that he had a reason not to take wages of the Corinthian church, but he also had a reason here not to take wages of the Thessalonian church, but it was a different reason. So it's not that it was wrong to refrain from taking wages, like some people believe as well. But wrought with labour night and day, with travail and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. So, what was he wroughting? Well, you know, uh, probably tents, like he did in Corinth. 
2 Thessalonians 3, 9. Not because, but look, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. So you see how Paul is making it clear. No, he had authority to take wages. He's refraining because he wanted to be an example to the Thessalonians. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So you see how he's trying to teach the Thessalonians, hey, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. So this is why he's saying, hey, this is how I'm going to work and eat as well. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So what's the lesson from, you know, Aquila and Priscilla? Well, first of all, you know, we want to be the sort of married couple that Aquila and Priscilla was. And also what we learn in this first part is, hey, you know, support your preacher financially. Um, you know, it's not always easy for me to say this, but, you know, it's good for you guys to know. And this is something that needs to be taught to Christians everywhere, that they need to support their preacher. You know, and not just, you know, emotionally and with prayers as well, but financially. It's the obligation of Christians of a church, just like it was the duty of the Levites, uh, of the other tribes of Israel, the 11 tribes of Israel, to support the Levites, right? And we want to be an example of hard work like Paul. Now, the second section, we go to Justice and Crispus. Acts 18, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. This is Paul and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own hands. I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. So, again, like we talked about last week, we want to be patient with unbelievers. A lot of people I know we'll sort of see these passages in Acts where, you know, Paul shakes off the dust of his feet. He says, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I'll go to the Gentiles. And they think that's, you know, having a 10-minute, 20-minute conversation with somebody who may be asking some questions and is not listening to them. And they're just like, oh, they throw their hands up and it's like, oh, I can't be bothered with you. From henceforth, I go to the Gentiles. I'm going to go, I'm going to, go to another house. But that's not the right attitude, right? Because Paul, even here in Acts 18, I mean, he's reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath, right? And he's trying to reason with them, persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So you can see here that he isn't making a concerted effort to try and convince them. This is not just him having a 10-minute conversation and then flying off the handle because, you know, maybe he doesn't know all the answers to their questions or maybe he's getting a little bit frustrated or taking things personally. That's not... The attitude we see here. So again, we see here Paul's patience with these people. But that doesn't mean your patience doesn't run out. You know, like here, his patience eventually ran out. And he said, hey, you know, I've tried my best. You're condemning yourself by rejecting this. You know, and maybe they don't have good reason to reject it either as he's reasoning them with them on, on the Sabbath days in the synagogues. Then he says, you know what? And, and that, that attitude is the same with God. You know, God is long-suffering. You know, he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But one day, his patience will run out, right? Just like we see here with Paul. Now, the other thing here, you know, we see Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, right? So this is likely when the Philippian church sent support to Paul, like Paul refers to in Philippians 4.15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia... Right? So he departed. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So you see there that the Philippian church stood out in the sense that, you know, when Paul went out to go preach and he was planting churches, he had to make tents. But the one church that supported him, even though he wasn't ministering to them in Philippi, was the Philippians. Right? And he was grateful for that. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity. So I have a feeling that even in Acts 18, when the Mas people, Timotheus and Silas, came from Macedonia, 
you know, he was making tents in Corinth. The Philippian church communicated with him and were supporting him. And even in Thessalonia, where he was trying to be an example, making tents, not taking wages of Thessalonia, the Philippians again were supporting him. So, you know, the Philippians were known as a very, you know, a very generous church, um, taking care of Paul. Acts 18, uh, verse 7, let's continue. <laughs> and he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. So you can see here that Justice lived right next to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall th set thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now what do I want to say here about Justice and Crispus? Right? So Justice and Crispus obviously, you know, was quite significant people in that community in the synagogue. I mean, Justice lived right next door, and Crispus was the chief ruler of that synagogue. He was the leader of that synagogue. Now, what we see here is these people followed Paul. Crispus believed. He converted and believed on the Lord. And look, because he believed on the Lord, it says here in verse 8, many of the Corinthians hearing what were they hearing about? Hearing about the conversion of Crispus. Believed and were baptized. So the point I'm making here is you can see that the conversion of these leaders in the early Corinthian church and in that synagogue led to many other people getting saved as well. Right? So these community leaders, they had influence in that community. And what I want to encourage you is you, as a Christian, you ought to use your influence as a leader in your community. And you say, well, Victor, like, I'm not a community leader. Nobody follows me, and that's not true. You know, you, as, a, as, a, as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, in your circle of influence, whether it's at work, whether it's amongst your family, you are meant to be the leader in that community. Right, showing them what it means to be a God-fearing Christian, to be a faithful ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, are you using your influence? Because you know, your example can have a positive or negative impact. You know, like our service to the Lord or our non-service to the Lord, you know, can spur others to follow in our footsteps, right? And we can be a good example or we can be a bad example. We can see here. The leaders in this community, they believed on the Lord and when others heard it, it impacted them too. So don't underestimate your influence. Maybe you're not a public figure. You know? Maybe you're not you know, a leader of some formal community group like, like I am to this church, but everyone is a leader in their inner circles in their rings. I was listening, my, well, I had a friend, uh, you know, who's in uh, Lib Dems, and he asked me to listen to this, uh, this talk by uh, C.S. Lewis, and maybe you should, all should listen to it too, because I think it was quite insightful. It's called The Inner Ring. Has anyone heard it? The Inner Ring? <laughs> There's a lot of lessons that come from it, but you listen to it in your own time. Go look up C.S. Lewis, The Inner Ring. You can, uh, you can read it, or you can listen to it on YouTube. There's somebody narrating it. But, but basically what it's about, it's quite interesting. He's just saying that there are, the, there are the formal structures of the world, but then there are also these unspoken structures, right? And, and really it's just, what it's basically talking about are cliques and inner circles. And, you know, he's saying that in life, sometimes the visible structure doesn't always align with the invisible structure. And, you know, there, there are things that go on and, and, and maybe because we were involved in politics and things like that, he's, he's uh, letting me know there's, there's all these inner rings. Anyways, my point is here is there are many lessons from C.S. Lewis's inner ring that you can go and learn and, and listen to that. But what, what it makes me think about here is, see, we all have inner rings. And, you know, your influence in your life may not be something that's written down on paper 
saying, you are the leader of such and such. But all of us in our capacity as believers and ambassadors of Jesus Christ have a circle of influence. And are you using your influence to affect positive change? Right? Are you using your influence to lead people in the right direction? Or are you leading them in the wrong direction? Hopefully you are like Crispus and Gaius. Uh, Crispus and, and Justice. Okay. Crispus and Ju Justice, who believed on the Lord, followed Paul, and because of that, many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So our example is very important. 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in charity, uh, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Let's go on. Now the next character we're going to look at in Acts 18 is this character by the name of Sosthenes. Sosthenes. Acts 18.12, it says here, And when uh, Gallio was the deputy of Archaia, so he's a probably a Corinthian ruler, right? That's ruling in Corinth, right? The Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. So just thinking back, you remember God says to Paul, he's got many people in this city, but they're not going to do him any hurt. <laughs> it's just funny because maybe that didn't apply to Sosthenes in this example here <laughs> because Paul didn't get hurt in this example. But Sosthenes did, right? So what's happening here? The Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul, brought him to the judgment seat, so they bring him before Gallio, saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, so Paul's now going to try and you know, reason and justify himself to say, like, look, Gallio said unto the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. So he's saying, like, hey, if he's actually broken a law or he's, you know, creating some actual havoc, you know, in, in my county, right, then I'm going to deal with it. But he's like, but if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look, look ye to it. He's saying, if this is a religious dispute, I don't want to rule, I don't want to rule over this. You guys go figure it out. For I will be no judge of such matters. And we can see here that he's just saying that because he's trying to remove himself from this dispute. But he doesn't actually care about the, uh, you know, uh, what's the word, where, where there's the lack of, um, what's the word I'm looking for when there's like, they, they're not actually following the rules and the laws there and there. Because later on, it says here in verse 17, so he's getting them away from the judgment seat, saying hey, there's actually some lewdness, there's actually some breaking of the law going on, then I'll judge it, but if it's just an issue of your, of your religion, you go and deal with it. He doesn't want any, uh, I, will be no, I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Well, look at verse 17. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, so this is probably a different synagogue to Christmas, beat him before the judgment seat. Look, and Gallio cared for none of these things. So it's, it's not that he actually cared about uh, the, the civility in his, in his uh, jurisdiction, because now they're coming and beating somebody uncondemned and actually causing physical harm and he just didn't want to have a bar of it, right? So what I wanted to point out here is, you remember that Paul was promised by God that, that he will not be hurt in Corinth. <laughs> but maybe that promise only extended to Paul because it didn't obviously extend to Sosthenes, where Paul is the one actually, you know, preaching the things and riling up the people of Corinth. But for some reason, the Corinthians grabbed the chief ruler of the synagogue, Sosthenes, and beat him up. Right? Beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of these things. Now, what I want to say about Sosthenes here is he was the chief ruler of the synagogue. And later on, we find out, you know, he got beat up for something that they were angry about Paul with, but because he was just, you know, one of the companions of Paul and working with Paul. You know, he suffered this beating and, you know, this humiliation of the Corinthians. But you know what, Sosthenes, he did not forsake Paul, like we talked about last week. He was faithful to Paul. Look in, when Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, look who's with him. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And look at this, Sosthenes, our brother. 
So we see here that Sosthenes was a very faithful companion of Paul, and even though he gets beat up for something they're angry at Paul about, he's still traveling with Paul. And I think Sosthenes is a great example of what Paul is talking about in Philippians 3, where Paul is talking about the things that he counted loss for Christ. Philippians 3, 7, For what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. So when I read this passage, I think of Sosthenes. You know, he was somebody that was quite well respected. He was leader of the synagogue, and yet, for the sake of Christ, he stood with Paul and was beat up by all these Corinthians. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So I think Sosthenes is a great example of living out this principle that Paul lived out, that he was willing to give up many things for the sake of Christ. So a question to you is, hey, what are you willing to give up for Christ? You know, some people don't even want to give up their Sundays. You know, some people don't even want to give up maybe their finances. Some people don't want to give up maybe their reputation. They're too scared to let people know. Look, look at what Paul gave up. Look at what Sosthenes gave up. We ought to be more like Paul and Sosthenes. Let's, call, let's continue. Acts 18, 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria. And with him, this is where we see Priscilla and Aquila traveling with Paul, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. And I'm not sure what this vow is. I wonder if he made a vow to return to Jerusalem. And this is why, even though they you know, knew he was going to get persecuted back in Jerusalem, he, he had made a vow to go back and, you know, and, and preach to his brethren there. He came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. So these Jews actually wanted him to stay, but he left, and it may be to do with his vow. But bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast. Uh, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at uh, Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So this is just Paul visiting the churches that he had helped to plant, going back over them as he's traveling on his way back to Jerusalem. Um, now let's look at one more character just at the end here quite quickly. And this is Apollos. So we looked at Aquila and Priscilla, then we saw Justice and Crispus, and learned some different things from them. We saw then... Um, Sosthenes, you know, faithful companion of Paul who was persecuted with him, gave up many things for the cause of Christ. And lastly here we see Apollos. Apollos. Acts 18, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. And we see here that Apollos was a very impactful person. You know, he had a lot of influence in the Corinthian church, and we'll see that a bit later. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. So he was passionate as well about these things. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So we see here a man that was taught in the ways of the Lord, was very passionate, very hardworking, very diligent, but did not have full knowledge. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, look at this, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now, I think it's interesting here. We already talked about Aquila and Priscilla being a great married couple. But here we see, see, it wasn't just Aquila 
that could correct Apollos, right? Because it says here, Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So you can see there, like sometimes in Christian relationships, you know, the Christian woman just is like, oh, just the man just speaks on our behalf. Women, are, you know, just don't really have anything to input. But that's not the case. You see here, Liz is a godly husband and wife, but yet they can take somebody aside, right, who is quite influential, quite high up, quite, you know, quite diligent, you know, serving the Lord, and yet still kind of, if I can say, like go toe to toe, if that makes sense. You know, and it's not just Aquila that's able to show, hey, look, this is where we can tweak what we were saying, or maybe what you're saying here is not exactly correct, or we're trying to give you a bit more information because you only knew about the baptism of John, and this is who Jesus is, and things like that, but Priscilla also could contribute to that conversation, right? So I think this is a good encouragement to, to ladies. You know, you and your husband can work together and also provide edification and encouragement to people that may not have full knowledge of the things of God, right? Like Apollos. And when he was dis disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, that when he was calm, help them much which had believed through grace. So you see, Apollos was a great servant of God too. And, you know, after learning a bit more from Aquila and Priscilla, you know, he's doing great things for the Lord. He mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So we see here that Apollos, if you didn't know, you see his name sounds familiar, well, it's because in the Corinthians epistles, he's referred to, and you can see his influence in that early Corinthian church. Because what did Paul say about Apollos? Look at what he says here. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. So one of the issues that was happening in the Corinthian church, division, right? Starting to have like a cult of personality, one person following one person another, you know, kind of like what you see happening in the NIFB, right? They all start together, and then now you've got the Andersonites, and then you've got to have that. And then when they start disagreeing, it's like, oh, well, I'm following this person, I'm following that person. And this is what's happening in the Corinthian church. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos. You see there? So you see how Paul had a lot of influence and people maybe say, yeah, well, I learned from Paul. I was this, you know, and uh, other people saying, well, this is what Apollos, you know, this is what I learned from Apollos. I have Cephas. Who's that? That's uh, um, Peter. And I, have, and I have Christ. Some people say, yeah, well, I'm like, uh, you know, it's like Christians today. Yeah, well, I'm just following Jesus. I'm following the Bible. You know, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So he's trying to bring them back together because I don't think Paul and Apollos were divided. I think these are people making divisions amongst them and trying to divide the church. But no, Christ is not divided. Paul is following Christ. Apollos is a companion of Paul, and they're together. They're trying to unify them again. But what I'm trying to show you here in the Corinthians epistle is obviously Apollos was a very influential person in that church if people are saying, I'm of Apollos. It says it again here in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions... Are you not carnal as walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal, carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So this is why I don't doubt that Paul and Apollos were on the same page. It was members of the Corinthian church that were trying to create division, not Paul and Apollos, because you know, they were giving all glory to God. They didn't care who got the credit. You know, it was about glorifying God. He says, whether he planted, Apollos watered, but we all rejoice together when God gives the increase. Now, a couple of things I just want to say about Apollos is 
One thing we can learn from Apollos is, you know, you can do great things for God and you can have an impact on many people positively, even if you don't have full knowledge. You know, you don't have to uh, think that you have to know everything 100% in order to have a positive impact in this world and to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ, just like, just like uh, Apollos. So even with soul winning, people say, oh, yeah, well, I don't know enough. I, hey, that doesn't mean you can't have a positive impact. You know, just go and share what you do know. You know, at least come along. Be, you know, be present. That helps as well. So I think Apollos is a great encouragement for us to know, hey, you don't have to know everything to do great things for God. But also one thing about Apollos is he didn't let it get to his head. You know, some people, they start doing things for God, they start feeling like they know a bit more than others, and then they start getting puffed up, like the Bible says, you know. Uh, it says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. But Apollos was a humble person. Look, he didn't know everything, and yet when others came and tried to correct him, tried to give him some more information, he was open to listening. He got corrected. Look, he did even greater things for God. So this is another thing we've learned from Apollos, that he did great things. He was, very, he was a very capable person, but he was also very humble, wasn't he, in order to learn from those that had come before him. And we saw that he became quite influential in the church at Corinth. So what's the lesson here? You know, don't let a lack of knowledge stop you from serving God and trying to teach others. You know, don't let that stop you from trying to teach others. Try and encourage others. Try and build people up. You know, like we talked about, you know, using the influence that you have. There may be people that look to you. You know, so use that. If you don't have to know everything, just teach them what you know. Um, you know, just teach what you know and, and continue to grow in the Lord. All right, so in conclusion, let's just uh, go over those lessons again. So number one is, you know, let's be like Aquila and Priscilla. You know, make sure you marry somebody you can serve the Lord together with. You know, be a spouse that encourages service to the Lord. Don't be a spouse that takes away from you and your husband or you and your wife's service to the Lord. Number two, you know, we want to be like Paul. Be a, be a good example of hard work and how to work and provide for your family. Number three, hey, support your preacher financially. Remember, it's your duty as Christians in a church, just as it was the duty of the 11 tribes of Israel to support the Levites. Number four, let's be like Justice and Crispus. You know, local leaders in their community, but all of us have our inner rings. You know, uh, we're all leaders in our own right as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. So use your influence as a leader in your community, you know, in your circle of influence. Be a good example. Don't be a bad example. Number five, be like Sosthenes. What are you willing to give up for the cause of Jesus Christ? You know, and are you going to be a faithful servant of the Lord in the good times and in the bad times? And lastly, be like a you know, Don't let a lack of knowledge stop you from serving God and trying to instruct others. Just teach people what you know and continue to grow like a All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, Thank you for um, loving us. Thank you for salvation. Uh, Lord, give us your grace and your power to live as we see others here living in your work. So help us to be more like these people we've looked at today. And um, pray, Lord, that you'll use each and every one here uh, in ways that they may not even know yet. You know, but Lord, you have plans for them. Um, I know that you can use them to do great things. Uh, so Lord, I just pray that they will be willing, that they will submit to you, that they will follow in your footsteps. And uh, Lord, um, you know, help us to make a huge difference to the world we live in. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.